Welcome to Vets to PM's Military Transition Academy podcast, the show where we discuss how to succeed in transitioning from the military service to the civilian workforce. This show and the academy it represents helps veterans transition into meaningful, lucrative post-service careers. Your primary host is Eric Doc Wright, PhD, Certified Manager, Military Veteran, Serial Founder, Best-Selling Business Author, Philosopher, Linguist, and Coach. Your other host is Jeremy Burdick, Project Management Professional, Scrum Master, Product Owner, and Retired Air Force Chief, and the current COO of Vets to PM and the Professional Development Unit University, where we will interview veterans successful in corporate America and business to bring you nuggets of wisdom every episode to make you more successful. Next, let's introduce today's guest. Our guest today is Luis A. Montanez, and I'm going to keep this short because his story is kind of how the episode starts off, and it is uh, exciting to say the least. But he's the founder of Concierge Business Solutions, or CBS for short, and the company was born from his desire to serve. He was in the Army over 20 years and three combat tours serving to build foreign nations. His vision to form a business that offers construction services for building renovations, maintaining the local communities and national infrastructure. Concierge Business Solutions really specialize in federal construction projects from $1 to $10 million. His formal education consists of a master's in accounting and finance as management and a bachelor's in business administration and accounting and a licensed contractor for the state of Georgia. He enlisted in the United States Army in 98, received a direct commission with the Army Reserves in 07, and then retired in 21 at the rank of major. Let's get started. You would not believe this cat in real life, man. At the MPP, bro, he was dressed to the nines, man. He <laughs> had so much game going on. Flare, pocket squares, whatever, man. Look like a million bucks, dude. Yeah, thank, so, you, uh, thank you. Yeah, so tell me about, uh, tell me a little bit about your army service and how you translated that into your own general contracting firm. And then Luis, also tell us a little bit about like, what do you think makes like veterans, re you know, just ass kickers in your space, man? Okay, well, um, Basically, I joined the military when uh, right after high school uh, from Puerto Rico. Um, I came from a very humble beginnings, you know, didn't have money for college, didn't even have money to buy clothes for college. So um, military was kind of my uh, best option at that point. I was I wasn't even ready for college at that point, because, you know, when you're 18, you don't know what's going on. You don't know what direction to go. But. I, I come from the GI Joe generation, you know, and uh, all I knew is that I wanted to join the military from a very early age. So uh, when I joined the military, um, all I can qualify uh, through because of my GT scores, I, I didn't even know English <laughs> back then. I wasn't fluent in English back then. So all I qualified was for infantry. So I came in as 11 bang bang. Um, they sent me to Fort Benning, Georgia. That's kind of where I learned about Georgia. And, I, you know, um, that was the first time I was in Georgia and uh, uh, went to Sand Hill, uh, became infantry. Uh, then uh, they kind of assigned me right there on the post in, in, in Fort Benning. So I was assigned to the 219th. Uh, they uh, kind of, you, you know, they kind of saw that I was, you know, bilingual. I was getting better in English. So they assigned me to the School of Americas. So there, I, they kind of made me an instructor, a kind of part of the cadre. And I was giving classes about um, the mortar systems um, to, you know, the different School of Americas in Spanish and English. Um, so I did that for about two years of my first two years of service, of um, active duty. And then they sent me to Korea. And in Korea, I was a scout um, at Camp Boniface, which is at the DMZ, did that for a year. And um, there is kind of where um, one of the best advices that I received from was a, a staff sergeant. You know, he was my, you know, he was kind of my platoon leader. And, you know, I was in debating, you know, th this was back in nine, 2000. This was 2000. Uh, kind of going into 2001 before 9-11. Um, so uh, the advice that he told me was, you know, I wanted to, I wanted to get a sign-in bonus. I wanted to, um, I had gone to airborne school 
And, you know, I wanted to go to Italy to a jump, you know, to some airborne unit over there in Italy. Um, but the, the advice that he told me was like, if you don't use your mind, your body's going to pay for it. Um, and he told me that after I was, uh, you know, I was disgruntled one day because, you know, they didn't want to offer me no bonus. They didn't want to change my MOS. They didn't want to give me, you know, the, the unit assignment. They wanted to send me to Fort Drum. <laughs> and I was like, you know, the hell with this. Um, I, I took his advice. You know, he said, you know, he told me those words. And, you know, with that, I started looking into college uh, degrees that I could get. You know, I, I, you know, I try to look for a job that was going to be recession proof, that was in high in demand. So I chose accounting, you know, business, um, you know, business uh, management and accounting. So I got out of the military and and my way out, they kind of convinced me to go into the guard, <laughs> to the National Guard. So, um, you know, I, I went into the National Guard and, and went with um, I had signed up for the GI Bill and started going to college back in Puerto Rico. So I, I, I you know, a few years later after. On 2000, 2003, I get deployed uh, to the Middle East, uh, still, is, still is infantry. I was still enlisted, did one year overseas, uh, providing guard, uh, providing um, security to commercial ships. Uh, it was called the Guard Mariners Mission. It was an awesome mission. We uh, traveled all the, the, you know, taking military equipment from uh, the States to Kuwait and we got to go into Iraq and it was an awesome mission. And, and that kind of opened my eyes to the world. Um, you know, we stopped by, you know, by Greece, we went to, um, you know, Egypt, all places, you name it, we traveled all that. So that was, that was awesome. So after that, that deployment, um, you know, I finished my college degree um, and, and in my junior year of my college degree, uh, being an infantry person, you know, we, we were given leadership abilities. We were able to command a team, you know, do, do assault missions, um, you know, uh, kind of, you know, uh, do all these type of exercises and, and, and you also build your, your character while, you know, being an infantry person and, you're able to uh, suck it up, you know, is, is kind of one of the words we use and being in the field for 90 days. And, you know, you, you just, you know, you just build your grit. And that's one of the characteristics you, you kind of need mostly in business and developing business. So I remember that in my June, in my junior year of college prior, you know, after I came from the deployment, I came with a little bit of money, you know, I, I purchased a, an apartment. And um, on my way of finishing my college degree, trying to get a job, um, they, I remember they told me um, at a, they, they offered me a, an assistant management position um, at, a, a, at a hotel. And when I asked to pay, they told me it was $6.25 an hour. <laughs> and I was like, $6.25 an hour with a college degree? I was like, no way, you know, I'd rather take the risk on myself and go out there and, you know, I, you know, I, I'm just, I'm just not working for six, you know, so that's, that was kind of my entrepreneur spirit. Um, I just, you know, I, as part of my um, uh, graduate, you know, as part of my degree, there was one class that I had to do a business study where I had to develop a business and develop a business plan and do all of that. And, you know, the business plan that I came up with was for a pizza shop, for a pizzeria, for a restaurant. So here I was 23 years old. Um, you know, I did this business plan and all of a sudden I found a good location that I was getting for 400 bucks a month. You know, I, I, I applied for an SBA loan. They gave me an SBA loan. And out of a sudden I started a, a pizza shop from scratch in Puerto Rico and um, that taught me a lot. You know, that taught me about cost accounting. It cost me about management. I was, uh, you know, I, um, I had to develop my soft skills with civilians, as we say, because I remember I hired and fired over 26 people in six months because, you know, the, the you know, people that don't have the discipline and don't have that military mentality, you know, they come in late, you know, they come in, you know, smelling like weed and, 
you know, don't have any um, integrity and don't have some of the selfless service and other, other, um, you know, other things that are important for us military and that we develop in the military. So I did that for about two years and, you know, then the economy kind of hit me in the gut, you know, the, the, the prices of gas started going up. This was 2006, 2000, yeah, 2006 price of food got started going up. Prices of gas has started going up. The government start, you know, doing different things. And, um, you know, I was working 90 hour weeks and I had to let go a lot of my staff. So I, I was just hanging by a thread and, and, you know, something that I learned you know, through college and through consistently educating myself is uh, something called opportunity cost. So through this opportunity cost, I was like, you know, I can continue to hold on to this and try to make it happen, or I can let it go. I'm still young. You know, I was, you know, 25, 26, let it go and, you know, go work for the man or (laughs) go do something else and then come back. So at that point, I had to let it go. Um, I sold um, a lot of the equipment and everything in the business. I had to declare bankruptcy at the age of 26. And, and you know, I started working for a pharmaceutical um, for a little bit. And then I was starting applying for federal government jobs. So, you know, by that time, I already had graduated. Um, and I, um, first job that I got that was with the federal government, uh, was with IR, with the IRS, you know, they saw my resume, military background. They saw that I had a bachelor's degree in accounting and business administration. So I started working for the IRS. You know, I, I worked, um, they were using my bilingual skills, you know, to kind of, you know, take the calls when, you know, people start asking questions about the IRS. So I did that for about, I did that about a year. And then I kind of went up, I started as a GS seven. And then um, I took this other opportunity where they offer me a GS nine with the social security administration. So there I go into the social security administration for about three years and, you know, call center stuff as well. But I, I learned a lot about the IRS and I learned a lot about the social security administration. So then after that, you know, I, I decided that, you know, this was 2009, 2010, um, Puerto Rico, the economy was, you know, pretty bad. There wasn't a lot of opportunity. You know, I wanted, I wanted to do big things with my life. I was like, you know, um, I, here I am, you know, I'm not doing too bad. I own, well, you know, I, I owned like two properties um, by the end, by the age of 29, I, was making about $57,000 a year, you know, not pretty bad, but I was like, you know, I want to be a GS 12 and I want to be, um, you know, I had big big dreams for myself and I wanted to just advance. So that opportunity wasn't there in Puerto Rico. So I started applying for federal jobs in in the U S and I landed at the uh, DCAA, which is defense contract auditing agency. And there I became a contract auditor. You know, I, um, they, um, they, you know, of all places, they, they had a lot of selection of places to choose. And I landed in Marietta, Georgia, which, you know, I was familiar with Georgia. I felt comfortable. And, you know, um, also the economy was tanked in the U.S. For a house, they had approved me for a $200,000 loan um, to buy a home. The type of home that I was able to buy in Puerto Rico versus what I was able to buy with Southern money in Georgia at that time, I was able to buy almost, you know, what I would consider a mansion, you know, at that time with, with that type of money. So I, I purchased a home and I moved my family, you know, I, I you know, I've been, I've been married, um, you know, since 2009, um, I have three kids. So we, we moved uh, to Georgia in 2010 and, you know, I just started working as a contract auditor and, and learning the world of procurement. You know, that, that's kind of what got me into procurement. And at the same time, you know, I, I, being an entrepreneur as I am, I saw how what was going on with real estate and how real estate was starting to pick up. So I started buying rental properties. You know, you could buy a rental property for like, you know, 40K. So I started using my TSP to kind of make a loan for myself and buying some rental property and fixing it and, 
And I found out that I was pretty good at it. You know, I was pretty good at writing up a scope, uh, hiring contractors, telling them what they needed to do, you know, fix it, paint it, and then put in uh, a tenant in place and then um, refinance the, the property to pay my TSP back and, and then have, you know, somebody paying me $1,000 a month in rent for a mortgage that was paying $300. So I was clearing, you know, $500 um, uh, a month of cash flow. So later on, I learned that that strategy is called the BRRRR strategy, <laughs> buy, repair, or, or buy, renovate, um, rent, and, and refinance. So I started doing that. I, I, you know, I built a portfolio of maybe about five or six properties, you know, with that, you know, through 2002 to 2014. And, um, you know, I'm still serving in the reserves. You know, I, I commissioned in 2007 is when I commissioned with the arm. I switched from the guard to the reserves and I commissioned, um, you know, I, I came in into the, I became an adjutant. Uh, which is human resources, you know, for those who are not familiar. And, um, you know, as I'm going through the ranks, you know, I served as a captain for a drill sergeant unit. And as I'm going through the ranks, I'm learning that there is an acquisition core in the military. And, you know, I love business. And I was like, man, they're going to pay me to, you know, be a businessman in a military suit. So I learned that um, in order to be an acquisitions in the army, you have to be a captain um, and it, it, it's a functional area, a specialty function. So I, uh, as soon as I became a captain, I put in a packet, you know, since I had a business degree and, and through the DCAA as an auditor, um, I applied to, for them to pay for my master's degree. So the DCAA, you know, the federal government paid for my master's degree. I got a master's degree in accounting and, and financial management. So, you know, I got that and um, I got accepted into the acquisition core. And as part of being in the acquisition core, they, they gave me three years of on the job training. You know, so they gave me three years of on the job training of being a contracting specialist. So I was a contract, you know, I had to leave my federal job. Um, for a while and come back active duty in the military. And, um, you know, I, I worked with the Air Force learning contracting. And then after that, those two years, they sent me a year deployed to be a contingency contracting specialist overseas. And um, they were going to send me to Afghanistan, but it ended up not happening. So they sent me to Kuwait, you know, it wasn't, wasn't or, or, or no, they sent me to Qatar. Uh, to Qatar, Qatar or Qatar, you know, however, however they pronounce it. And there I was basically, they assigned me to the construction team of, of acquisition. So I was kind of responsible for putting um, requirements together related to building fobs or construction related things. And I ended up in Dubai um, helping, you know, build uh, relocatable buildings in Dubai, a part of a FOB. And I just fell in love with it. You know, I, I, I became very resourceful with it. I was the type of guy that you will put in the middle of nowhere and I will make, you know, shit happen. And, um, you, know, I, you know, I was able to negotiate with people in the Middle East and get them, you know, to, to do different things and was very creative by, you know, sometimes they value more um, cattle and, and goats <laughs> and stuff like that than money. So sometimes, you know, we, in order to barter, we, you know, we use, you know, um, U.S. money to buy, you know, sheets and then, you know, trade that for doing construction work. So it was like, you know, it was awesome. Um, when I came back from that deployment in 2016, um, you know, that's kind of where I was like, I'm not built for this office work no more. I have some um, income coming from my rental properties and I just put in my resignation. You know, I put in my resignation, got out of the federal government, um, back, backing up a little bit. You know, once I saw, um, you know, once I was auditing these big companies like Boeing and Lockheed Martin and um, Georgia Tech, and I was seeing all the money that they're coming in through contracting with the federal government. And, you know, once I became in the, in the acquisition core and I was seeing 
you know, how how simple it is to, you know, get a contract from the federal government and start getting paid and, you know, doing, you know, building that sort of business. That's kind of where I kind of made the decision that I, hey, this is kind of what I want to do. Um, you know, I, I built my, you know, I, I built my um, corporation in, in, in 2012. I set it up as an S Corp. And, you know, I, I started doing, you know, construction work on the side, you know, moonlighting it. You know, I started with flooring. Um, what attracted me to flooring was that, um, you know, I was looking for businesses opportunity. And I saw something in the decorative concrete space. You will go to Florida, you take a two week course and they show you how to, you know, grind floors and put colors on it. And, you know, it sounds pretty easy, you know, they kind of they kind of sold me on that idea. So, you know, I just I went down there and I learned about that and I said, OK, well, this is going to be my specialty area that I'm going to learn about, you know, being a contractor. And later on, you know, I'll develop it from there. So. You know, I started, you know, building a website and, you know, hiring people to help me build a website and build a social media presence in order to sell construction services, you know, basically, you know, on residential basis. Um, um, this at, at this point, is there any questions? I don't, you know, um, any questions so far? Should I keep going? Am I in the right direction? Dude, all I got to say, Luis, Jeremy. Right. Like all I got to say, brother, is when you write your biography, dude, I'm buying three copies. And when they make the movie about you in Hollywood, brother, I'm going to see yeah. it twice. I mean, yeah. Luis, man, you remade yourself like nine different times, bro, over like two decades. And you started in the infantry and you couldn't speak English. I mean, dude, you use the word grit, dude. Like if you look up grit in the dictionary, bro, they got your photo next to it. Just. I, nothing but freaking impressive, dude. I had goosebumps like 19 times during that. Jeremy, I told you this guy would be great on the podcast. You believe this guy? Yeah, it's like, it, it was like a continuous thread. I wanted to jump in there, but I just couldn't find a, I didn't want to stop you. You know, ultimately I thought the story, the way you just told the story was, you know, I, I heard a bunch of different stuff. You know, one thing it was, you know, I started at, you know, at the bottom and it is an E1 in the army coming from Puerto Rico. So you kind of naturalized into, uh, you know, the contiguous 48, but then also heard, Hey, it was a journey of all the way to a major, but then that was the military side of things. But then you took it to the personal side of things too. It was like, Hey man, I'm an entrepreneur. I, I bought properties. I've got a business, a, yeah, a pizzeria. I mean, I, what gave you the courage to just step out and knock out like just the, just starting with the, that must've been a, a scary proposition on the first business, the pizzeria, for example, and then watching that kind of fade away and making that opportunity cost decision, just kind of walk me through that. I know we're kind of backing up a little bit, but there's okay. a, a lot of entrepreneurs out there that won't take that first step because of some piece of fear of failure. How did you wrestle with that? Well, um, you know, that that has to do a lot with uh, my upbringing a little bit because, um, you know, I, I grew up in a single parent home. Um, you know, uh, I, I, grew, I grew up, you know, my, and my mother was working at a factory. Um, you know, she worked most of the day. So I, I, I basically had to raise myself, you know, in, in a sense. And, and in Puerto Rico, she was working at three dollars and twenty five cents an hour factory work. Um, so from early, from seven years old, I was selling mangoes, you know, just to kind of, you know, buy me stuff. You know, I will, you know, I will go, you know, I will see a tree in the backyard and I saw it full of fruit. And, you know, and I said, Hey, you know, this stuff is rotting out here. You know, there's people like mangoes and, you know, I just put a stand in front of my house and, you know, there was a lot of car traffic and, start selling mangoes. You know, I, you know, I saw people had grass in the backyard and, you know, I said, Hey, let me get a lawnmower with, a, with my mango money and buy me a lawnmower and start cutting grass and get money from that. And then it was always, uh, it was always finding a need for me to fill, fulfill in order for me to get money out of it. So from a very early age, you know, I was never afraid to kind of find opportunity to make money to you know to survive you know if you if you look at the heart um at the Marslow hierarchy of needs 
you know, I was in survival mode. I know I've always been in survival mode. And, um, you know, so when it came down to the pizzeria, you know, it was, it was kind of seeking that because, you know, the military and the infantry kind of fulfilled that world whenever, you know, whenever you're deployed, I deployed three times, you know, by the way. And, you know, I've always been like, you know, just like working and serving and, and, you know, being able to find, you know, solve problems, um, you know, such since, since from a very early age. So, uh, when it came down to the pizzeria, you know, I had done a survey, I had done a market survey, you know, they, when I, whenever I asked people, Hey, what is it you think that's needed in this area? Oh, we need a pizza shop. And we need, <laughs> so I was like, Hey, here you go. Let's, let's build a pizza shop. And, you know, I never been, you know, I've never been fearful of that because, you know, I always think about, you know, my, my deathbed. And I always think about, you know, what are the things that I'm going to wish that I have done that I never did? And, you know, building businesses and, you know, taking risks is something that, you know, I want to be able to, you know, uh, I want to be able to be happy, you know, when that moment comes to say, hey, you know, I took the risk and I, and I did it. So hopefully that answers your, answers your question. Oh. You know, and Luis, I mean, oh, heck yeah, dude, like answer 4X, bro. But so... <laughs> For the account, so uh, for all of you out there listening in MTA Podcast Nation and you're entrepreneurial or you're thinking about being entrepreneurial, right? So a couple key things that Luis hit on, man. The first one is, you know, you don't have to be a CPA. You don't have to get a PhD in finance. But if you're running a business, you ought to know finance and accounting. You ought to at least know what the CPA is talking about. You ought to know what the financial statements are at a minimum, right? He was using creative finance. He, it, you know, their financial statements capture the results of historical performance, i.e. the management decisions you've been making so that you can make better future financial management decisions. And then you heard him, the mango money guy, Luis, since he was seven, has figured it out. You know, this Luis, I'm at DOD MPP with you, brother, a couple of weeks ago. And I meet people say, well, I'm a veteran owned business, you know, and I got this thing and I'm trying to sell to this agency, whatever. That's not solution selling, man. They don't need what you want to sell them just because you want to sell it. That's not their problem, bro. I got a problem. I need a solution. Do you sell that solution? Sell them the solution first and then go make what you want to make. Go find mangoes, go cut grass, go do pizza. Like once you get past performance, then sell the agency what you want to sell the agency. So that's the second key thing I heard, man, is constantly hustling, looking for market fit and market need. Hey, you need mangoes? Stand by. Hold my beer. I'll be right back. I'm going to go grab some mangoes. Hey, you need your grass cut? Hey, man, hold my mangoes. I'll be right back, dude. I got to go get a lawnmower. Like, just those two key things, you leverage that in a business, you'll be successful as a small business owner, right? Or an emerging business, uh, the SBA would call us. So, dude, just just again, man, personal stories are are such a um, a light on the hill, man, for, you know, those of us out there searching around like, hey, man, I don't quite feel working for the man. I think I want to do my own thing. You know, humble beginnings, humility, but man, great results, dude. Just love it. Love it. Awesome. 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 But yeah, um, I, I feel the same. I, I really enjoy the journey. That's the one thing that I hope my kids um, are able to have. Because, you know, yes, the results, you know, will come. But yeah, if, if, if just enjoying the journey and, and, and you will find that the more you add it, you know, the more the more you add it, you find that people will, you know, the, you know, hopefully, you know, I've had good people and bad people come through my journey to, you know, either hold me back or push me forward on, 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 it, on my on my mission. But I've I've been consistent in developing, you know, uh, uh, my vision, and and also developing, you know, and holding my values. And values are important because, um, you know, yes, you may go ahead forward if you're not, you know, if you're not being, if you're not having integrity, and if you're not, um, you know, holding your word and doing what you say you were going to do. But eventually, people stop wanting to do business with you. But I found that at my journey, just by holding my army values, you know, you know, saying what I'm doing, what I said I'm going to do and, and, and having integrity and caring for the customer and, you know, finding a win win solution on everything that I do, that the right people come along and they help me, um, you know, build my vision. 
And um, so that's that's kind of what I can you know say about that. Um, um, what of what you were talking about, but um, if we if no other questions, I can continue on with the uh, flooring business. <laughs> yeah, well, no, I think I think you're you're hitting on some really great stuff, and I think it all yeah. kind of stems back to you know the sergeant that said, "Utilize your mind, or your body's going to pay for it." <sighs> yeah, yeah, and that's that's very deep. That's very deep because it was very true. You know, I'm I'm in my 40s right now, and um, I'm 100 percent service disabled. You know, I'm, I got a bad back. I got a bad, you know, bad knees. I got, you know, bad shoulders, everything going on. But, you know, um, yeah, I have a good business that I, you know, I can continue to talk. You know, I'll talk more about that. But, um, yeah, it's, it's true. If you don't work your mind, your body's going to pay for it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And so many times that happens through, you know, every, a lot of different veterans that we talk to, right? They everybody wants to continue to jump out of airplanes and and pull triggers and go and go prosecute war the way we want we in our mind think we can still do but it all catches up and i, mm -hmm. I think it's a finite resource your body so it's it's kind of one of those what good on that sergeant you know for one seeing that but two saying it out loud and for anybody that's yeah. listening to this, I, I agree wholeheartedly is if you don't hone the mind, that is, that's one thing that'll outlast your body in most senses, go get a skill, a mental skill that you can utilize post-military career. But uh, yeah, talk a little bit about your flooring business. I, I'm, yeah, I'm yeah. No, and for sure. And, you know, and from the military as well, I have to say that, um, you know, I, I had, I had several you know, several sergeants and se several people in my military career that gave me advice that served me through life. Um, you know, another one was like, hey, um, you know, even, um, you know, choose your mentors carefully. But, you know, you you mentors not, are not only people that are developing you, but also a mentor can be somebody that is is doing it wrong but it's showing you what not to do when you become a leader. So I, you know, I've had mentor, you know, I, 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 I don't have a particular mentor of a person that I said, yes, this person has been with me 20 years and has shown me everything to do, but I'm, I'm a person that learns by ob observing. So I, I'm a great observer of people and success leaves crumbs. So I, I, I kind of, you know, people that are successful, you know, I, I kind of learn from them and I see what trends they have and what what capabilities and I model that. And people that are not successful, the very bad leaders that I've even had in the military, I kind of always look at that guy. And between the guys, you know, even us, you know, the, the squad, the E4 mafia and stuff, we were like, we're never going to be like that, dude. <laughs> So you you learn from that too. So um, um, and going back to the flooring thing, it was challenging. You know, I, I quickly learned that you know selling you know to to customers um, is very difficult. Is very emotional. You know, selling a three thousand dollar item to you know a homeowner is is challenging. You know, I had to beef up my selling skills. Um, you know, kind of, you know, I use, I use my military brand, you know, I started building my military brand of saying, Hey, you know, I'm prior military, you know, veteran owned business, you know, um, um, and start using that in my marketing and it started helping up. But at the same time, there was a lot of expectation, you know, they were like, Hey, we're trusting you with our business. You better do a good job. So, um, building a team, um, I, I had, I had, I built it up to like, 25 employees at one point and it was very challenging. I was spending around, you know, 25 grand a year just in social media marketing <laughs> and um, trying to keep crews busy and losing money sometimes because I pick up jobs that were not a lot of good margins and, and um, you know, and I needed to keep crews busy. So, uh, you know, I just took on these jobs and, you know, it, it was a lot of challenge and, what I learned from that was that, you know, it takes the same amount of effort to make $3,000 than to make $100,000. It takes the same amount of effort to do $100,000 to take a million dollars. So um, 2020 comes around and, you know, I'm doing commercial, I'm doing residential, I'm doing government, very small portion of government. 
And 2020, you know, comes around and, you know, people are not opening their doors to kind of work in their homes and they're not taking calls. And, you know, um, it was difficult to keep the crews busy anymore. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm making, you know, in my, in my flooring business, I'm making, you know, a year I made half a million dollars. You know, I came up 200 in my first year of being fully devoted to it. I made, I made 250 K, which was in 2017, 2018, I make a half a million dollars, 2019, I make um, almost a million dollars, like 900K, but I lost 900, uh, like 90K. I, I, made, I made almost a million, but the, I lost 90K because of what I said, you know, a lot of marketing money, you know, crews not caring, you know, what they do. I try to develop them. I try to put, you know, uh, project managers in place. Um, I, I kind of came into a bit of a bad partnership with a Marine you know, person that I had as a project manager, I, you know, but he, you know, he wasn't project managing of, you know, being out there in the field and taking care of the crews. He, you know, it just didn't work out. And I made the conscious decision that I said, Hey, I applied for a PPP loan. Those, those two or three PPP loans rescued me. I took care of, you know, paid the crews and I'd be like, Hey, I'm changing my business model. From this point forward, I'm solely pursuing government work. Um, and the way that I'm going to pursue government work is that I'm going to be the only employee of my company and everything else, you know, I'm contracting it out. You know, my project managers, um, we're doing 1099s. I, I've developed many businesses that I said, hey, you know, I really, I, you know, I want to be a sole company. I'll help you set up your LLC and I'll hire you as, you know, for consulting services. I'll show you what you need to do to, you know, to, to do your function, either as a superintendent, either as a project manager or, or you know, or, or as a subcontractor. But that's the route that I'm going because I, I, I've noticed and I, and I have recognized my strengths and my weaknesses and my strengths are that I'm very good at developing scopes of work and holding you accountable to what's in the contract. And I'm very good at setting a vision and I'm very good at financing, but I'm terrible at project management and, you know, you know, being a technical person of construction. So that those were our functions that I hired out or subcontracted out, you know, to a group of people that are much better at me than at me at that. So I started doing that and I started focusing on what I'm good at, which is getting contracts, getting government contracts. So I started putting, doing a lot of bids on government contracts and I just start winning all these contracts. You know? <laughs> and I started pursuing contracts from one to $10 million. And, you know, I, I, you know, through these, through these conferences that I've been going to and, meaning through different people and through what I said earlier that when, you know, people see your integrity and people see that you're a person that they want to do business with, they automatically will refer you to somebody that can help you push your business or, or that sort of thing. So they connected me with a bonding agent that helped me build my bonding capacity. He helped me reach to a, a teammate that helped me give me more bonding. So I, you know, I've done teaming agreements with, um, you know, HVAC companies that they have a um, hundred million dollars in bonding and they don't do nothing with it and they don't know how to get into the federal market. So I'm, Hey, I'm like, Hey, I know how to develop proposals because I wrote these, you know, for the government. I know how to bid because I'm finance. I was an auditor. I know about direct and indirect expenses. I can, you know, estimate, or I can hire a team of estimators and know if it makes sense. I can read scopes. So we started winning these projects. And, um, you know, right now, um, another thing as well is that I went ahead and got my GC license. I got my general contractor's license because I'm like, well, I'm running a construction company and I need to know more about this construction. So, you know, I got my last two um, months of GI Bill. <laughs> And they paid for my, you know, they paid for the two, you know, the books that I needed to get my GC license. So I got that. And um, now we're doing around, you know, we're sitting at a general, con general construction services. I switched from flooring to just being general construction. And we're doing, you know, this, this year, 
we, you know, we did around $20 million worth of construction work. And um, so, you know, went from, you know, so, so we've, we've been growing on very big strides and we're doing work from the, all the East coast of the United States, including Puerto Rico. I've done disaster work in Puerto Rico back in 2008 for Hurricane Maria, you know, and, and it was the same thing, you know, I just flew to Puerto Rico when Hurricane Maria um, hit, um, no contacts, no nothing. I went to Puerto Rico. I used my resources from my childhood and started using the grape vine. So that's another big term that, you know, I, I, I encourage people to learn the grape vine. Sometimes it's not, it's sometimes it, that, that, what that means is, it's not who, you know, uh, or it's not knowing how to do the things. It's having the phone number of the person that knows. So, you know, the grapevine, you know, theory is, you know, you go to somewhere and you say, hey, this is what I want to do. I want to help Hurricane Maria. You know, I got some contacts that, you know, we can put a contract together to start picking debris up and start, you know, restoring some houses. And, you know, one person leads me to another. And all of a sudden, well, then now I, I have 19 guys that, you know, are picking up debris. I have a subcontract with a very big contractor, you know, um, and, you know, I have a bunch of subcontractors that are picking up debris and, you know, made a million dollars in three months <laughs> so, through the grapevine. <laughs> so for, for everybody, if there's anybody in the audience listening, right, corporate America, hiring manager, veteran who knows a hiring manager, like Luis is saying, let's, let's grapevine this thing out, right? If you know a hiring manager in the company you work for, I want to recap just real quick, what Luis has been talking about for like the last 19 minutes. Okay. You've heard integrity. So a lot of times from corporate America, we hear, oh, I get this resume. Oh, it's got all these acronyms. Oh, it looks like gobbledygook. Oh, I don't know what value this person's bringing. And a lot of times they're looking at operators. They're looking at infantry. They're looking at indirect mortar fires. They're looking at, they're looking at operational type resumes, right? So here's the takeaway, gang. In summary, he said integrity. Now, I'm paraphrasing, but here's what he was talking about. Here's the intangibles he's going to bring to work. So if you want to hire somebody that you got to worry about coming back from lunch on time and, like, can they do anything beyond fog of mirror? Hire a vet. Here's why. Even an infantry guy. Check it out. Here's what Louis said. I bring integrity. I bring curiosity to solve problems. I'm focused. I know how to say no. I'm candid. Uh, I can fire customers. I'm tenacious. And I'm honest. I have high empathy and emotional intelligence. I know where I'm strong and I know where I'm weak and I'm hire, I hire people that shore up my weaknesses and I exploit my strengths. I mean, Coach Lombardi said it best, right? Hey, Green Bay Packers, they named the trophy after the guy. Here's how we win. Strengths, weaknesses. Great. We're going to hone our strengths to the point of even if the bad guy knows our weaknesses, he can't take advantage of it. Like he can't touch us. So when you read that resume, if it says infantry on it, corporate America, let me give you a clue. If it says infantry, you might want to talk to the guy or the gal in an interview and suss out all these intangibles because you might be staring at a Luis and yeah. if you hire him, he might do the work of nine people in your company. I'm just saying, right, and, Luis? And, and if I might, if I may add one thing, um, selfless, selfless service. Amen, brother. Selfless service. I'm very big on that. Um, you know, part of my vision was, you know, that, you know, I, I went, I went overseas, um, you know, to, one, put my put my life at risk, you know, for for my country. And two, you know, I was I was, you know, I, you know, I was I was serving to build foreign nations. You know, I was doing construction, you know, helping build foreign nations by by, you know, doing construction work and all that. And when I came to the U.S., you know, my vision was, you know, I want to help build my community. I want to serve because that's the only, you know, having purpose is so important in our lives. You know, I, I, I you know, I've, I've had, um, you know, PTSD and I've had depression of coming back and anxiety attacks because of all that. But, you know, every time that that comes up is when I don't have a clear purpose, you know, when I don't have a mission, you know, when I, you know, I was kind of, you know, in a, in a point, I was in a cycle of finding deployments because being overseas was the only time I had, you know, that everything made sense because, you know, I feel this great purpose and I come back to the U.S. and I feel this vacuum. But, you know, I was able to fill that vacuum by being in construction because I've learned that, you know, I the, 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 the point where I feel that everything makes sense 
is when I'm in chaos. You know, I feel peace and chaos, if that makes any sense. So, but the big thing is service. You know, when whenever you're doing selfless service and you're helping build your community and you feel that, you know, you're, you know, and in my case, you know, I'm, I'm building VA hospitals, you know, doing, you know, so I, I feel so much fulfillment of purpose of that, that, you know, the PTSD, the depression, the anxiety doesn't take place because, you know, I feel great, you know, uh, great fulfillment with that. So selfish service is something else that us infantry and military people bring. Wow. Yeah. I mean, I, I, well said, right. I think, uh, so many people need to hear that. And the, and I think it's a shared sentiment. They just maybe can't always put it in words the way you just did. Whereas, you know, we do in the military, they do create a lot of chaotic situations and we then must become comfortable with it and we get desensitized to it. And then when the volumes turn down, you know, like you get back home and you're in your bed and everything's quiet, you feel like something's wrong. Like, mm -hmm. I've been breathing oxygen and drinking water and, and all this. And it, it's just not enough. Like now I need that chaos to mm -hmm. kind of feed that norm that my mind has created to deal with the situations that I was in. And I, and I a hundred percent agree with you because I felt the same way as uh, let's go do another mission. Let's go get back into the fight. And the reason is I feel at home there. I feel like I'm useful. I feel like I'm needed. I feel, you know, you're the scalpel in the, in the uh, doctor or the surgeon's hand. Where yeah, yeah, the tip of the spear. Love right. being the tip of the spear. <laughs> and, and the danger, like, I don't know if it's the danger creates the, yeah. it just keeps you out of the, out of your mind. I, I think that's the biggest thing. And that's at least what I'm picking up from what you said is if you get yeah. yourself back to busy and back to purpose, when you get back on, uh, back home, that will feed into some of that need for chaos and you'll start to create a scenario where that feels normal. And then that anxiety, depression, and that feeling of uselessness will start to fade away. So I, I really appreciate you bringing that up, Luis. I think that's yeah. amazing. So really appreciate that. Appreciate it. So I think that's kind of, you know, um, kind of uh, the brings us to the present of what we're doing and um, in the future. Uh, right now, I am creating, you know, looking for partnerships, creating partnerships uh, with, you know, to the bottom and upper echelons. You know, I'm looking for partner, you know, I'm trying to uh, do different partnerships with companies like CBRE and bigger general contractors that can help me expand my business to the West uh, of, of the United States where they have the, the, the resources and the teams to build uh, construction and that, you know, they, that they want to come into the VA hospitals and that sort of thing. And we can create some sort of partnerships to achieve the mission of the VA. So I'm, I'm very key to finding partners that share my values um, and that, you know, um, at the end of the day, you know, the customer is first, um, at the end of the day, you know, if, if, if I bring any partner to, you know, work with the VA hospitals or work with the VA mission, you know, I, I always say that, Hey, you know, the customer has to be important. Yes. Profit is important, but you know, we just have to share those type of values. So, and at the lower level as well, you know, I, I, I help subcontractors all the time. I'm, you know, I'm part of the Georgia Hispanic Construction Association. I'm part of the national, what is it called? The uh, uh, National Contracting uh, Management Association, different, different associations where, you know, I find subcontractors all the time, like, oh, I don't know how to get into the federal government, um, you know, and I, I help them because um, that has become my unfair advantage. And some people don't understand that term of unfair advantage, but, you know, unfair advantage is, is, is in a sense, if you look it up in, in marketing, it means when you're working in an area that, you know, you're, you, you have so much knowledge that you've gained for the years that you competing in that area uh, creates a barrier that a lot of people can enter. So I, I, I help people come into this space of the federal government market because, you know, I've been successful on it because of the unfair advantage that I've developed through all my experience that I ex expressed um, previously. 
So Luis, so where can uh, brothers and sisters, where can contractors, where can subcontractors find you, man? Like if, if they want to chat with you about opportunities and stuff, how can they get you a capability statement or like, you know, get on your radar, dude? Well, you know, I, I do have a LinkedIn account. Um, I, you know, I do have, you know, a website, you know, conciergebusinesssolutions.org. In there, I have a subcontractor link that they can, you know, provide me what service they provide, they provide a capability statement. Um, you know, I'm, <laughs> I, you know, my, my, my email is info at conciergebusinesssolutions.org. I don't even got a, per, you know, even for my own business because, I really believe, you know, I, I I can I can go on a digress in a different subject there, but you know, I I I really believe that right now I'm just creating a system to a point where eventually I can extract myself from it and do other things that I want to do and my business be able to function on itself. So info at conciergebusinesssolutions.org. Um, you know, I'm in the Georgia Marietta area. Um, um, I'm at a point in my business that I'm, you know, really um, able to have free time and, and I'm, I'm, I'm owner of my time. And that's something that's so freeing right now. That's kind of the biggest reward that I have right now that, I, you know, I'm, 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 I'm financially free. I'm owner of my time and I can do what I want with whom I want and, you know, where I want. So, that's that's very that that was a whole purpose of me working the 90 hours in the pizza shop and working since I was seven years old. And this was a point, you know, and, and I achieved that, you know, at my I believe I'm still young, but, you know, I'm 40. I just became 43, you know, <laughs> in, in April. So uh, it was it was a great achievement. Um, so, yeah, they, they can reach me through LinkedIn, um, through my website or through my email, that sort of thing. Hey, man, Luis, I'm really uh, excited, dude. Really, really stoked that you carved out some time for us, man. I, I mean, I know the audience is just going to love this episode. So thanks for all the stories, dude. And holy cow, man, you're an inspiration, brother. Nothing short of for sure. I appreciate it. Thank you. <laughs> JB? Man, I, I think ended up, you guys wrapped it up perfectly. I mean, uh, honestly, I've learned a lot. I, I don't think I've taken this many notes during a show. <laughs> <laughs> And, and this is uh, we're on year two, so uh, I just appreciate all the knowledge you dropped from you know vocabulary words like opportunity cost, all the way to uh, unfair advantage. I mean, I think that that's uh, people will learn from this episode. I guess my last ask for you, Luis, is what's one tip you would give somebody that's transitioning service, and you know they need one tip of the day. Um, you know, one, one tip of the day is, um, you know, start, start, start early before the transition, you know, start making networking. Um, so my, let's go back. So the one tip is to network, 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 you know, and Facebook and LinkedIn doesn't count. <laughs> go out to events, shake hands, kiss babies. Like I say. You know, go out, shake some hands, kiss babies and, you know, meet with people and 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 be, you know, start being a, a good assessor of character of people. You know, um, it's, it's good to observe people um, and judge them, you know, not by what they say, but what they do, what their actions are. So, um, you know, network, uh, put out what you want to the universe, you know, express what you want. And, you know, if you surround yourself by the right people, they will bring it to you. You know, they will kind of recommend, oh, you want this? Well, hey, there's this person and this person that will, you know, help you do it, help you achieve it. So that's only achieved through networking, you know, meeting people, expressing your your desires and your intent and and, and getting those connections that way. And and, you know, and, and keep pushing forward. <laughs> hey, brother. And as we uh uh, walk out of here uh when your autobiography hits dude i want an autograph yeah i get an autograph oh, copy oh you know i, right. I don't really get much attention i like to fly <laughs> right you know below the radar you know i'm not i'm not you know i'm not all about that but 
for sure. <laughs> All right. we, we got a nice sneak peek here. So I do appreciate it. Um, thanks, Luis. Uh, as we wrap this up, thanks again for spending time with us and uh, look forward to hearing about more success. All right. Thank you. Thanks, gents. Bye-bye. Thank you for tuning in and spending a bit of time with us at the Military Transition Academy powered by Vets to PM. If we picked your interest, but you want more details, please head over to the website vets to pmcom and see if we can help prepare you for a better tomorrow or a future meaningful and lucrative career.